what I've been calling a death by Davos closing. So I'm going to not speak any more because otherwise I'll be doing death by Davos. That's nothing against Davos or, or where. Um, but I'd like to invite uh, Karina, who's going to kick us off. So, Karina. Hello, everyone. Oh, that's loud. Um, and welcome to the final session, deliberately not called a closing plenary, because as you'll see, we have a big mix of offerings for you at this um, last session of the day. And um, we're very happy to be here with a very distinguished group of speakers and performers that I will go ahead and maybe start by introducing my co-facilitator, Pablo Suarez. And we also have North Coast performers here to join us. Please go ahead and just wave to the group. I introduce them because what we'll be doing today is in the spirit of having a high energy, out of the box, memorable closing session for this day, we're going to be weaving in interviews with, uh, as I mentioned, very distinguished speakers that have um, agreed to be with us today and share some of their thoughts on what it takes to build a movement for more ambitious and transformative climate action. We will have a short talk on what has been the ingredients for success in movements in the past and where movements perhaps have not worked. We have a beatboxer in the house that um, is right here from New York, part of uh, that whole movement, which I think is a new experience maybe for most of us in the room, I would venture to say. And then, of course, uh, North Coast Performers, of which uh, Amir the beatboxer is part of, is a group that does improv, hip hop, and comedy. And so they're going to help summarize many of the messages that we'll hear on stage today and really inspire us and challenge us to think of how we can harness culturally relevant, um, way, culturally resonant ways to have people join this movement on building resilience and taking climate action after we leave the room today. So thank you all very much for being here. Um, maybe to start, I would like to invite our first two speakers to join me on stage, and we're going to have a short uh, round of interviews, and then let's get going. We'll see how everything comes together, and we uh, very much welcome to the stage. If I could get the next slide, please. We have Gebru Jember, who is the former chair of the LDC group. He is, please come to the stage, Gebru. Very nice to have you here. <laughs> you can sit right here. Gebru is a former chair of the LDC group and um, regional lead on climate diplomacy for the Global Green Growth Institute, also lead of MRV, and of course, champion of Life AR, which is very ex has very exciting week ahead. So thank you very much, Gebru, for being here. And our um, second speaker today, we're very honored to have Her Excellency Maria Fernanda Espinosa. You may please come to the stage. Uh, Ms. Espinosa. Please write. Oh, yes, thank you very much. Ms. Espinosa is the president of the United Nations General Assembly of its current session. She is also former Minister of National Defense of Ecuador. Uh, former Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs in Ecuador, and of course, um, Foreign Minister of um, Cultural and Natural Heritage. So thank you very much for being here, Ms. Espinosa. Yes. So of course, we're all here to talk about what it takes to, to build a movement. And we have our... Um, colleagues here who have had a long uh, track record of doing so in their various guises. We have um, Mr. Uh, Gebru Jemba, who of course has uh, his, perhaps your own take on how you build a movement working with the LDC group, now with uh, Life AR. I wonder if um, you could tell us a little bit about what do you think it's, is needed to build a movement for delivering ambitious, transformative climate action? Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, I think um, uh, from um, uh, if you look at what's happening right now from the 
uh, globally with an increase of one degree Celsius. There is no one immune from the impacts of climate change and the variability. However, the world is struggling to achieve a temperature goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, the main reason for that, I believe, is we are just thinking business as usual. So the world needs to really think out of the box in terms of how we can plan out of business as usual and how we can implement the other way. The current implementation which is happening in most of the most vulnerable countries is a sectoral approach, project-based and area limited, which doesn't have really significant impact. So uh, if you want to have impact, long-term impact, we need to move from away from business as usual. Uh, in this regard, the LDC's response to keep the momentum is by setting a vision to be uh, have a climate resilient economy by 2030 and to have a carbon neutral economy by 2050. In that regard, we have launched Life AR and uh, it has its own key asks and offers. We believe that everyone needs to be a leader in this process. We need to move from away from victims' narrative into a proactive leadership so that everyone needs to be engaged. So in this regard, our initiatives like the Life AR will be a mechanism for the front runners to set their long-term strategies and address their gaps in terms of increasing their ambition. So at this point in time, I would like to invite everyone to be part of the solution in this process. Thank you. Wonderful. So a call to everyone to join the uh, Life AR initiative and support it. We have uh, heard, of course, in this room the power behind the LDC group in order to get 1.5 degrees in the uh, Paris Agreement, the mobilization efforts there. And of course, uh, Gebru, with your uh, leadership, we've had um, a lot of mobilization around these causes that really address the needs of the poorest and most vulnerable. So thank you very much. Ms. Espinosa, I have the same question for you. You, of course, come from a very different perspective, having been a leader on the national stage in your country, and now, of course, right down the street here at the United Nations. Maybe not the place everybody thinks of where movements spawn, where they're built, but what do you see from your vantage point and from the long history of um, working to serve the people um, in terms of what it takes to build a movement on resilience, particularly uh, climate action now? Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation to this uh, uh, very unusual event. I'm, I'm really looking forward to see what happens after we speak, you know, the formal part. And um, th honestly, I have to be very honest, I, I, I came with a speech. I, they told me resilience, the new school, so I, okay, the speech, etc. And that, then they told me, you have two minutes, and you have to <laughs> really, and you have to compete with performers, uh, people that are really fun. But in any case, I, I think I already used a couple of my two minutes, a minute and a half. <laughs> but, you know, very quickly, perhaps three messages. The number one is that uh, just to thank the Global Resilience Partnership, because that's how we should build a movement with networks, alliances, and partnerships. Mm. That's what we need, strong alliances, partnerships, inclusion. But alliances and partnerships are only possible if we have a whole of society approach, mm. meaning everybody is on the same boat, meaning citizens, peasant communities, indigenous peoples, women, youth organizations, et cetera, et cetera, the private sector, governments, uh, and perhaps more importantly, local governments at the local level. Uh, so strong partnerships, alliances, and networks, number one message. Number two is about translation. Mm -hmm. It is about communication, awareness, and education. Why? Because, please, I mean, let's all of us walk to the street here in New York and ask people in the street, what is resilience? And people would look at you and say, what? Resilience. 
climate resilience. Oh, very good. People pretty much understand what <coughs> the climate crisis is about, but resilience needs to be translated mm. to the people on the ground. And perhaps my colleague from the LDCs, if we want to build a movement, we need to explain people that to build uh, resilience uh, is a whole of society responsibility. And resilience means survival, especially, for example, for the small island developing states. Resilience means survival, means well-being, means livelihoods, means the food you eat, food security is about resilience. Is the water you drink, it's because you know you have developed capacity to be resilient to the you know devastating effects of, of climate change. And the and the number three, perhaps uh, the umbrella we need in this translation exercise and effort is to look at the sustainable development goals and the 2030 agenda as an embracing <coughs> umbrella for us all. There is no possibility to build resilience if we continue to, you know, expand the gap of inequalities, if we, we're not serious about eradicating poverty, about access to people to safe water and sanitation. I mean, this is also resilience. For me, the magic formula for resilience is to deliver on the Sustainable Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda. Uh, so th these were the, the, three, the three points I wanted to make. Networks, partnerships, alliances, whole of society approach, translation, education, awareness building, and number three, the sustainable development goals. Thank you very much. So I see we're all here. Also, of course, knowing the SDGs and seeing climate action as being a key part of the SDGs. We have all gathered together, I think over 50 organizations came together to put this day together, partnerships, networks, and we have the uh, communication. How do we communicate with people outside this room, people that don't understand every single SDG and the processes behind it and what climate resilience is? How do you translate cl climate resilience to other languages, for example? How accessible is that term? So how do we communicate that? And we will see how that can be done in one particular way a little bit later today. Like just. Please. Just can I praise something that I just saw, the closed caption thing. Um, thank you very much because we do need, part of the resilience is accessibility for persons with disabilities and that's very good that you're doing this. I, I, I have been doing this at the UN the entire year, so <laughs> bravo for that. I don't know if it's usual or the normal thing to do, but this is great for the people that uh, have a disability, that's accessibility yeah. in action, so thank you for that. Yes, accessibility, inclusion, this sets the standard also for everybody to see. It can be done in GRP, that's um, something I know that has been front and center of all of our uh, planning calls and um, an example to continue to uh, follow in future events we organize. So. Thank you very much. I, we are sh a little bit short on time. I'm not going to rush you off the stage, but I do appreciate sticking to time so that we can now move on to the next part of the presentation. Um, everything that the interviewees will be saying today are inputs to what we'll hear from the performers. The audience, I think I neglected to mention at the beginning of the session, <coughs> you will also be engaging through Mentimeter and tweeting, et cetera. So this is really something where you think you're sitting there watching some interviewers, but get ready because it'll be your turn soon too. So thank you very much. <clears throat> you. So for the uh, next part of the session, I'd like to invite Pablo onto stage who will um, give us some food for thought on what it takes to build a movement. Pablo. Hello, friends. It's okay. Long day. You're very kind to be here. Uh, my name is Pablo, Pablo Suarez. Some of you may know me in my capacity as a humanitarian worker. There was a time when I was a full-time researcher on climate and disasters. I knew almost two decades ago that we knew enough. Now we have to act. And now I'm part of the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center, where I am uh, leading most of our work on innovation. but. The entire team and our partners are innovating a lot. 
I'm very happy to report that because I've learned that I've been failing consistently at communicating what needs to be communicated, I started working with artists to the point that now I have just today signed the paperwork to become artist in residence at the, the recently established Adrian Arst Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center. So thank you, Kathy, if you're around. This is to say the journey from researcher to working with artists continues to be full of learning and full of weird stuff. So now I'm going to share with you some of the awesome unusualities that I've had the joys of being exposed to. My colleague Amir uh, Shaban uh, is, when you say out of the box, you have no idea what box entails and what beatboxing entails. Um, we're talking about building a movement. Movement is associated with people doing something and succeeding because of the massive presence. We are all endowed with the ability to communicate, perhaps through a microphone. Most of us have more access to microphones than the rest of the global population. What we do with those microphones is usually talking about resilience and climate and how important it is, and yet the movement doesn't happen. Why is it that we talk and people don't start the movement that we need? We need to figure out how to amplify our message. And we've been trying to amplify our message through institutions, through processes, through UN systems. We have to continue doing that. I have found that art and culture are the best ways to create additional resonance. So I wanted to share with you this. Do you think that these people are about to start a movement? <laughs> this is a photo from my first UN climate convention. 16 years ago, I'm going to attend my 16th consecutive UNFCCC COP in Santiago this month. This is what we do. We subject people to a sequence of PowerPoint presentations followed by insufficient Q&A, and then we tell them, start a movement. You know what you have to do. <laughs> now, when I shared this at the UNFCCC secretariat, one of my dear colleagues pointed to a person who is over there You're laughing, but that's how it feels, isn't it? We are feeling the dread of inaction. Now, for those of you who were at the march yesterday, quarter million people here in New York City, many more elsewhere, you may have heard a certain person say, everywhere I have been, the situation is more or less the same. The inaction is the same. Now, I have to tell you, this morning I got really terrifying awareness of what it means to be a young person, not because I became young, but because I facilitated a session with young people. And they were confronting us, the more white hair people in the room, saying, why, why are you doing this to us? You invite me to a UN Youth Summit, you make me sit down while you guys talk to us. I could watch it on YouTube. I would watch it on YouTube if I wanted to hear you say those things. You're wasting my time and you're suppressing my ability to interact with others. And it hurt because we have all been complicit in ensuring that we do what we are comfortable doing. We give visibility to our team or our process or our keyword, etc. And you know, Greta has a very valid point. This is a cartoon from the New Yorker magazine. Traffic jam, people are stuck. It feels like us. We say we should do something, we're stuck. What's the caption to the cartoon? Try honking again. It feels like what we're doing. We're just honking, saying again the things that we think should be said, and nothing happens. The system in front of them is not changing. Research shows that showing research doesn't work. <laughs> now, note that those words have something about, the idea is awesome. I learned it from John Sturman at MIT. Research shows that showing research doesn't work. There's something to those words that it's not only the idea, the content, but there's a rhythm to them, yeah? That makes you resonate. Information, everyone has information, disasters, climate, travel, etc. Some people say, shoot, I, change my, I better change my habits and try to make, make a difference before it's too late. 
while others say, shoot, I better buy a big old car and enjoy myself before it's too late. If we want to build a movement, we need to get people to go from that side to this side and do something and put their body somewhere new. That's what a movement is. Um, do I push there? Now that's movement. That's a movement that most of you should be familiar with. Mahatma Gandhi did not start a movement only by thinking complex thoughts, which he was very capable of. He also knew how to tap on the underlying culture of his time and place. He was very fond of the khadi, the, the traditional cotton, the wheel that spins the cotton, that movement, that pace, that rhythm was associated with traditional identity, with self-sufficiency. And it is that the reason why he could be so serene while having people next to him going, yes, let's fight the strongest empire in this planet. We confront a similar challenge. And we're failing as climate people to understand that we won't build a movement unless we tap on that underlying culture. Uh, he <laughs> I'm, I'm a student of humor. And I learned that Gandhi was also a phenomenal humorist. When a journalist asked him, Mr. Gandhi, uh, you're going to meet with the king. Uh, do you think you're properly dressed to meet the king? And he answered, don't worry about my clothes. The king has enough clothing for both of us. <laughs> so he made people laugh. And in that process, revealing an important truth. He tapped and he argued for the need for joy for successful movements. Martin Luther King, he didn't say, I have a nightmare where we continue to be, you know, segregated by pigmentation. He had a dream and he communicated that dream tapping on the culture of that oppressed people, which included the tradition of singing. A form of singing that involves a lot of call and response as it came from Africa. For those of you familiar with Amazing Grace, powerful, it still makes me cry when I think of it. There's a verse that says, because I was blind, but now I see. A movement needs to help people see. And we're failing to help people notice if we keep talking only in the way we're talking. I'm talking too much, going faster. We're all familiar with the adorable statesman, gentle elder Nelson Mandela, but this was Mandela once, a fighter who used to say, For those of you who don't speak the language that I use without knowing, apologies for butchering the proper pronunciation, he would say power, Amandla means power, and people respond to the people. Unless people responded not awetu, but ngawetu, which is power to us. And if you haven't seen the movie Amandla, there are two awesome moments. It's a documentary about the role of music in this movement. Two impressive moments. One is the cops, the policeman in charge of torturing and repressing those who are asking for equal rights and so on. There was only one moment when they were genuinely terrified. And it was when the people were on the streets dancing the toy toy. That cultural resonance made them realize that they were going to lose and they did. Uh, and then when Mandela was finally released and he had a gentle dance, that, that created cultural resonance. We have many more cases, Rigoberta Menchu in Guatemala, uh, Wangari, of course, in Kenya. And now, among the many women in the world who have been changing the way we operate, a fierce 15-year-old girl who refused to accept the world as it was presented to her. And she went from a solo strike. Note that she started a movement by not, um, she started a movement by not moving. And now, sound amplification enables her to deliver her messages such as, I want you to think like your house is on fire, because it is. So I want to come back to this. We all have access to a microphone in our lives. There are audiences who want to see, who want to be mobilized. How can we use this? When I first experienced Amir's use of a microphone, I thought there was cheating. I thought there was a play, a, a recording, and he was like, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I can promise you that what he does 
what you'll hear is what comes out of his mouth, like boom, boom, tsh, you know, only more so. This is to build a transition into what will follow in the session, which is how are we going to rethink our instruments so that we can have more cultural resonance? How can we be more creative with what we have to enable people to feel like I want to be part of that, I want to be part of a movement? Enough said, Pablo, you're talking too much. Amir? hoping that through osmosis I can get some of that. It's unlikely. But so here's the, the challenge for you. What you heard is completely improvised based on what comes to his mind, the human analogy, his three other colleagues who joined him on stage, to riff off what is said by the speakers and by you. So now Karina is going to take the task of you and to say, like, what is it that we want to amplify? What is the thing that we want the performers and the rest of the world to listen to us make things their own will be different, will be theirs, but will be more people than one. So, Karina, we're going to start with you. Okay. So, we're about to get a slide. Thanks, Paulo. Awesome, Amir. I mean, that's New York. <laughs> the culturally re resonant uh, approach here that we want to offer to you today. Um, we're going to have now a slide that's going to come up that will invite you all to do just this. Think of one sentence that can inspire our movement. We talk about resilience. We talk about climate action, urgency. What is it that happened today that really resonated with you that you want people to think about when we say we want to build a movement? Think of that one sentence and one line. Now we're going to have Menti Reaper is um, what we're going to use for this. You go to menti.com if you take out your laptops, your iPhones, whatever you have to connect you to the internet. Go to menti.com and use that code 900796 and enter your one line in there. We're going to start seeing your answers pop up on screen in live time. North Coast performers are paying attention. We're all paying attention to the ideas in this room about what it takes to build a movement. So over to you.
ideas up here, you've all been reading along. Let's leave this up here for just a couple moments. Take a, take a quick look, wrap up the final responses, and we'll move on to the next segment of this session, which is more of our next three um, distinguished speakers for this day. So try to think of President Jose Figueres to the stage. Thank you very much. And we're also honored to have with us today Sheila Patel. Sheila, if you can come to the stage, please. Thank you. And last but not least, Barney Whitford. feeling energized for this next round and inspired as well. So today is actually going to become just a quick view and we're trying to collect these different viewpoints from what we build this agenda for the Oblivion Project. And we are most honored to have President Jose Figueres here, former president of Costa Rica and first uh, CEO of the World Islamic Forum and president currently of the Fighting War Room and chair of OCE also you would call this the Global Eight Initiative. <laughs> and <laughs> I could go on. And so thank you so much for being here today. I was wondering what is your take on this and wh what it takes to build the movement that we need at this point in time? So I think a movement that is um, both resilient and resistant is all of you people that are now going into your second hour of meeting. <laughs> so thank you very much. But on a more serious note, uh, beyond the very good um, arguments that you drew out and that you landed, I would say for understanding uh, what the challenges are, the takes that place of urgency, that place of Einstein, by which you want to solve these things, and also that you will assist accomplishing this mission, something that we know is being successful and is going to happen. With respect to Barney and what you are saying, Sheila, I want to believe that the understanding will be broadened by the fact that we bring in a few men who have seen the most dramatic meltdown of the intelligence that we have ever seen. We have seen the hottest summer for the Muslim community that we have ever experienced. We have seen the Amazon fire flay through that zone of the planet, and we have seen the growing Palmo crisis. If we don't get the message out to the world, what is the point of being able to do what we've done? The sense of urgency comes from Haiti when we talk about not only campaign, but we also talk about persuasion. Johan Rockstone this morning devoted his first paper points to systemic thinking. And you cannot think of climate change without thinking of oceans, and you cannot solve the ocean issues without thinking of climate change. The IPCC report is coming out on Wednesday, the first over an ocean. It is not going to say anything we are not expecting because it will tell us that the ocean, our most important ecosystem, the one that provides the oxygen for every second breath in our lives, that fixes 25% of carbon and that has absorbed 93% of heat increase caused by climate change. Otherwise, this would be 36 degree centigrade higher. That ocean is in dire need of a movement to restore its health. And the mission part comes in by not only agreeing with what Maria said in terms of the SDGs by 2030, but with respect to the ocean, making sure that we have conserved through marine protected areas, 30% of the ocean by 2030. We need to bring that up forward. Next year, we celebrate 200 years of the discovery of Antarctica. It would be a fantastic way to celebrate it if the world declared the entire Austral Ocean around the Antarctica a marine protected area as the best way to create resilience for Antarctica and for the role it plays in the climate space. Thank you, President Figueres, and shedding a light on what I feel 
is not always at the front and center of all of our talk about resilience and building a movement. We have very different perspectives here, and I think Oceans is now front and center on the, on the radar for us. Um, Sheila, you come from a very different perspective as well as chair of Slum Dwellers International, working directly with grassroots representatives, grassroots voices, representing lived experience and local knowledge of um, where many of the movements are born. What would you say is most needed at this time to build um, a movement that reflects urgency and ambition to deliver a climate resilient future? First of all, let me say I'm deeply humbled in the company I'm in. Uh, I am startled every moment with new knowledge, new understanding, new insights. And I think that for those of us who have been part of the Shack Dwellers International, we draw inspiration from women who have lived in terrible poverty facing complete denial of rights and entitlements, who are looking for ways to not only transform their own lives, but to transform the lives of everybody around them. It's a very humbling experience to understand that they should be throwing stones at everybody who has destroyed their lives, but they go and seek partnerships, alliances, and relationships of trust. Mm -hmm. And for all of us who have now entered the climate space, because we op operated on secure tenure, the right for basic amenities, and to transform intergenerational deprivation, and to transform the way in which resilience, you talk of resilience, there is nobody who has the ability to make lemonade from limes mm -hmm. than poor women because they have transformed the understanding of resilience into one in which they produce something out of nothing. Mm. So for me, the, our, our, explora our collective exploration of climate, the first liberation we have is that everything we want, everything the women from our movement want is good for them it's good for their city and it's good for climate. Mm. Because nobody conserves, nobody cares, and nobody nurtures more than poor people. And they don't sit on the high horse and say, we aren't producing emissions, why should we do something? They say, no, let's be proactive. Let's transform our cities. So for me, uh, Pablo showed Gandhi. Gandhi's most amazing thing was to make everything that people do every day into making them believe that they were in a movement. Mm. You know, his most significant thing was his topi, you know, the cap. Wearing a cap is not threatening to anybody, but it made everybody feel they were part of a movement. Everybody uses salt. You don't want to pay a tax on salt, you make your own salt. That's being part of a movement. So you make doing things that work for you into a movement. Mm. And for us at SDI, and for a lot of the social movements who are sitting here, the things that they are doing to conserve today can be amplified through the science of climate change. So we, see, we don't see climate change as something that's going to rob stuff from us. It's going to help us leapfrog into a new environment which works for everybody. Because we don't believe that SDGs and climate are two different things. It's like we heard this morning that it's the same thing. You can't have climate change without social justice. And you can't have SDGs without equity. So. We feel that these things work for us and that by doing, you know, I like this thing that research shows, I love it, I'm gonna use it all the time. Because our movement believes that doing and showing what can be done is what inspires people to do the right thing. Mm. Just telling them 
and lecturing them and making them victims just drives them away. Thank you. Barney, thank you for being here today. You, of course, work closely with Sheila on the Global Commission of Adaptation as co-director. And you've also had a long career at UN Environment leading the adaptation program. What have you seen most recently that to you is different that can help spark this movement or um, accelerate the movement that we already see around climate change? What maybe it was resonated from what you've heard from the other speakers so far, or what would you like to add to this conversation? Thank you. Um, yes, just a few observations on, on, on what I think uh, we need to, to, to build a, a movement on adaptation. First point, we are not starting from zero. We may not be where we should be. We may be coming to this too late. We may be behind the curve, but we are not starting from nowhere. And look around you just in this one room to see some reflection of the uh, uh, diversity and, and range of actors who, who are already uh, uh, committed to this. We, are, we need to build a movement, not an organization. There will be no party line. Uh, it will involve a very diverse range of actors with different opinions, and there will be disagreements and differences within that movement. And we should uh, uh, cherish that and value that. I think there are some specific, a couple of specific points about a movement, what it takes to build a movement on adaptation. Something reflecting the nature of the adaptation challenge. Adaptation requires, to build a more resilient world, we need action at all levels. At the global level, at the national level, at the regional level, at the local level. And we need to recognize that the movement will, be, will include actors at those different levels. But we, what, what we need to make it a movement is to make sure that, every, that people at different levels are speaking to each other. Mm. And what I mean by that, let me just try to give you one example from the Global Commission on Adaptation. The Global Commission on Adaptation, it's in the name. We are up there somewhere at the global level uh, trying to make the case for adaptation. But unless we are making it easier, unless we are facilitating action on adaptation at other levels, unless we are doing something to make Sheila's work in SDI easier, then we will have failed. So we need action at different levels, but we need the, 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 those different levels to speak to each other. We also need because, because climate change impacts are so pervasive, we need action across the board. We need action on health, on city planning, on building resilient infrastructure, in agriculture, and so on. One can go on. So we need a movement, a broad movement of actors across all those different uh, areas and topics and challenges. We need, and I think this is very important, we need to be able to tell a positive story about adaptation and about building resilience. And I think there are two parts to that. We need to show it is in your interest, in your interest, in your interest, in your interest, and in my interest whoever we are. We need to show it is in our interests. That is the first point. Part of that case is an economic one. The Global Commission, in its recent report, just released, makes the point that if we were to invest $1.8 trillion in adaptation action that would have a benefit cost ratio. It would deliver benefits to the value of 8.1 billion. 
That's a benefit cost ratio of in the region of three to four to one. It is in your interests, your interests, your interests, and our interests. But it's not just about economics. As Sheila said, the movement for adaptation has to have fairness, justice at its heart, otherwise it will not work. If we are not proposing just solutions to the climate challenge, we will not bring everyone with us, and we will not deserve to bring everyone with us. And my final point, and I thank uh, uh, GRP and the organizers of this final session for reminding uh, uh, me at least of this point, and this is a little bit personal. Along the way, we do need to have some fun. <laughs> this is, it's hard work, there's a lot to be done, it's big challenges, but let's, let's be nice to each other and let's have some fun along the way. Thank you. Thanks, Barney. I think that's also a perfect segue for what's coming next. Uh, we've heard partnerships, we've heard trust, we've heard community, we've heard understanding, climate justice, um, everything that was put up on the Mentimeter um, slide with your answers, lots of ideas in the room, of course. North Coast performers, would you have any questions that you'd like to ask of our speakers on the stage and also, of course, um, Ms. Maria Fernanda Espinoza and uh, Gebu Jember on the front row right there. Um, sure. Uh, so as, as improvisers, uh, when we're on stage and we're listening to our other improvisers, we like to pocket ideas. That's kind of a trick we have is I'm going to pocket that and use it later. What's one idea from the day's events or just this concept as a whole that you're pocketing to take back with you? Um, something that maybe you didn't learn about until today or something that didn't really resonate with you until today. So just like a quick one word or even like one sentence that you're like, whoa, I've, I've never thought about it in that way before. Mm -hmm. Who'd like to go first? One idea, one thought you're pocketing to take home with you from today's event. Barney. <laughs> We can do this. We can do this. We can do this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> President Figueres. We can do this. So I was impressed by the, the, the need to go from arithmetic way of thinking to exponential way of thinking about our solutions. Mm -hmm. Great. Any thoughts? That sounds great. Okay. Good. Good? Thank you. Yeah. What's that? She wants to dance. dance. Music. dance. All right. All right. I That's think great. there might we be can, opportunity for we that. Can <laughs> that. Great. So I would like, to, with that, to thank our three speakers for joining us on stage, and I invite you to take your stage back. back in the seat. <laughs> All right. And so then, without further ado, sure. those performers. Thank Talk you. about being humbled. Thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate We're in a room that, I mean, truly, <laughs> we're just some comedians from New York. So we really appreciate <laughs> being here. But we're really honored to amplify the messages that you've uh, introduced us to and, and, and reintroduced us to today. Uh, so we are hip hop improv comedians. I'm sure you're very familiar with that term, uh, right? Uh, that means that, yes, we are here to laugh. We are here to amplify your message. So we encourage you to be a part of this, to move your body, to laugh with us. And also, please keep in mind, we are improvisers. That means we are making up everything we are about to do as we are doing it. Just like Amir did on the microphone, we here are all improvising. What we do today will never be seen again. <laughs> so uh, you're welcome. <laughs> all right, and without further ado. <clears throat> Serious. This can be a party. We're hanging out here at the GRP. We're at the GRP. We're at the GRP. We're at the GRP. We're at the GRP. Keep me healthy, just like a potion. You know who I am. I am the ocean. Yeah. We gotta 
Break the fishes, keep everyone happy, make everyone's wishes come true by preserving it. Don't you see? It's so I important. Yes, you know, we got to conserve for the world, for all the little boys and the girls. He's the, the ocean. ocean. He's I'm the, the ocean. ocean. He's I'm the, the ocean. ocean. He's I'm the, the ocean. ocean. Yeah, I'm about to talk here with all my brilliance. Who am I? I'm resilient. Yeah. Yo, sing along. I'm here because my muscles are strong. OK, we got resiliency. We learned a lot of that from Her Excellency. So come on. Yes, you sing that song. We are resilient, and we should all sing along. Oh, she's resilient. 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 All the fish are coughing. <laughs> That's never happened to me before. I've swam across many oceans, the Atlantic and the Pacific and all the other ones. And, and now I, all the fish are, are coughing. Achoo. It's sneezing. It's, it's fine. I'm sure it's just allergies or something. <laughs> no, you know what? Now, oh, what's this on my arm? Is this plastic? What oh, the yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Take a look at me, okay? I'm a fish, but I look like a scrapbook. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you look really bad, Denise. <laughs> I'm sure it's fine. I'm sure it's just, I'm sure it's just seasonal. I'm sure it'll clear up soon. Yeah, maybe there's some Claritin or something that'll clear this right. Yeah, up. some allergy <laughs> medication would be great. Yeah, my, yeah. I'm so surprised that first of all you have human names, and second of all, <laughs> you take over-the-counter human prescriptions. That's crazy sauce. <laughs> It's crazy sauce, but how else are we going to survive? I mean, every single day. You know, look, I get out of bed like any other fish, one fin at a time. It's right? true. And I go to school just like any other fish, one uh, class room at a time. But with like a lot of other fish. A lot of school, other, school, yeah, of school of fish. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, we have our problems too. But lately, <coughs> it's gotten a lot worse. Oh. Yeah. What? Yeah. You're getting sick? You're getting sick? Well, we got to fix that. Yeah. You're getting sick? You're, You're getting, getting sick? sick. Well, yeah, we got to fix, fix that. that. Yeah. Yes. I got, I'm getting so sick. Yes, please, won't somebody fix it quick? I swear. Yes, my fins are thinning. I don't even know if I can keep swimming. I swear I got to fill that quotient, but I'm feeling so sick up in this ocean. Oh, it's not so much restriction. I swear I need another medical prescription. You're sick. You're feeling sick. sick. You're feeling sick. sick. Well, we got to fix that. Yeah. <laughs> you feel sick? I'm feeling, feeling it. Sick. I'm feeling it. Got to gotta fix that. that. Yeah. yeah. You feel sick? Yes. You feel sick? <laughs> well, we got to we fix got that. To... You? Yeah. Yeah. you feel sick? I feel sick. I feel sick? I feel sick. Well, we got to fix that. Yeah. 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 What I think about the GRP, I got to say, making change, it starts with me. Yes, 
Here's the thing, in my mind, I will cycle. We need to stop throwing away and start to recycle. Stop putting things in our water. It's not good, no matter where you're from. It doesn't matter about your hood. We need to protect all the sea creatures. Oh boy, so many features. Do you sick? You, you feel sick? sick? <coughs> but we got to fix, fix that. that. Yep. Let me get this off of you. We got to uh, oh, oh, fix that. Oh, uh, we wow. got to fix that. Thank you, human. Thank you, human. Now I got to go to Walgreens and up my Claritin. You, you go to pharmacies, <laughs> too? I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Just, uh, look at that, a uh, person on the streets in New York. I wonder if he knows what resilience means. <laughs> How bad could this be? Everybody's got to know what resilience means. Hi, do you know what resilience means? Whoa, you've got a microphone, cool. Yeah, I, uh... Do they just hand those out these days? No, I'm, uh, I'm a student at the new school, and uh, I'm in my documentary film class. I was just hoping I could go around to strangers on the streets of New York and ask them what resilience means. Resilience? Yeah. Uh, I'd say, like, resilience is when you upgrade your iPhone to the next iPhone, and that means you can drop it in the toilet and it doesn't break. <laughs> Brad? 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 I am Brad. Is that what resilience is? Right. I, don't, I don't think that's the resilience we're looking so for. I don't okay. think so either. I don't think so. Let's all ask right. someone else. Okay. We're in New York City. All right. I'm just the on screen talent. You're the director who knows all of the things. That's true. Here we go. Oh, look at that. A working mom, <laughs> I assume. Uh, <laughs> Excuse me, ma'am, um, do you know what resilience means? Wow, that's a very old-timey camera. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's a, that's a, CT, a, CT, uh, a, CT, a CT5. A CT5? CT5. CT5. Stands for oh, wow. chaplain. Gosh, well, I'm just here, I'm just a working mom, so just, uh, did you have a question for me? Oh, yeah, do you know what resilience means? Oh, gosh, I tell you, resilience I mean, in general, it mm -hmm. just means I can get out of bed in the morning and get through my day. All uh, <laughs> right. <Woo! laughs> you know? You know? Uh, so is that helpful? But, I, th uh, um, I, don't, I don't think that's the type of resilience we're looking for either. Oh, no. No. I mean, all these people, they're giving us different definitions of resilience, but that's not what we want. We want, you know, people to really feel. That's all. Brad, Brad, where, Brad, where'd you go just a second ago? I oh. saw your mind go to a, a, pl a different place. Sorry, sometimes I go into like this, this, this world what? where it's 2030 and we've met all of our SDGs and we're like, we're like chilling on the beach, <laughs> drinking Mai Tai it's under an umbrella. It's the future, the future. The future. Now. The the future, future is now. now. The future, the future is now. now. The future is now. The future is now. Dirty, it's pretty good here in 2030. Yeah, the future has arrived, and guess what? what? We're still alive. Yeah. Oh. It's amazing, it's fulfilling, but we gotta keep doing it for our children. The future is now. The future is now. The future is now. The future is now. Oh, I love the future. I just gave it a chance. Oh my god, I just want to dance. I'm so happy. I'm I love the future, 2030, here we go, everybody, say it with us, oh! The future is now, the future is now, the future is now, the future is now. Look at all the sand, what a really cool feature, chilling out on the beach of Costa Rica, yeah. And I'm laying back drinking my Mai Tai, oh my gosh, I'm such a cool guy, oh! Everyone's being so resilient, everyone's looking so cool and diligent, yes! I love that we all have responsibilities, and words that rhyme with responsibility! The future, the future is now, the future is now, the future is now, the future is now! The future is now. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Come here. Thank you. Let's see if this works. Thank you. Can you believe that? Like, very, when presenters were presenting, many of you were listening somewhere between kindly and attentively. 
when you spent you know, yesterday in some other event, which that other event was probably boring, and you looked at the faces, there wasn't that much listening going on. But I could tell you that the listening faces of these performers, when the presenters were presenting, they were amazing. They were so tuned. They don't know, I don't know how much they knew about the SDGs or the LDCs before coming, but artists can be phenomenal listeners, and we can learn from that. Cultural developers, people who create and shape culture, can notice and can create resonance faster than the rest of us who are you know, institutionally oriented and doing the things we do. So here's your task. We're in New York City. New York City has culturally iconic things such as improvisational theater, comedy, and hip hop. When, you, when Sheila goes back to her town and starts hanging out with people who live in very, very unfortunate conditions in South Asia, she's not going to ask them to do hip hop. Or maybe she will, I don't know, but there may be other things that are culturally resonant there. For if you are from Guatemala, from Burkina Faso, from Argentina, from Tokyo, there will be things that are resonant for you. When Nelson Mandela became who he became, and very soon there was a controversy about rugby, he understood that rugby was so central to the I evolving identity of South Africans that he thought very hard about how to make rugby a metaphor for racial unity in a country that was confronting very tough choices. So a question for you is, think about what message you want your country to embrace, similar to the ones that you may have uh, mentimetered before, and then name one thing about your country that is a cultural or artistic manifestation that creates resonance. For example, I'm from Argentina. Hip hop, I don't know, but soccer, we will resonate. Tango, maybe the older generation. Malambo con boleadora, you may not have any clue what that is, but it's awesome. So I would have to come up with what is the thing I want to say? What is a, a, an, an art form or a culturally resonant enterprise, sports, culture, uh, you name it, and then formulate one crazy idea for something that my organization could do, the Red Cross colleague, the World Bank, the GRP, the Farmers Association, and you'll have to tweet that. Now, we'll give you, what, Karina, five minutes we have? So you should have time to think about this very quickly and very quickly find the neighbor and tell them what you're thinking about. You're gonna tweet and guess what? The performers are going to try to read your tweets and do something after this. So this is a very difficult task, but not as difficult as what they just did. So think about something worth saying, think about a culturally resonant artistic manifestation in the place where you come from or your organization. Maybe in my office we play video games and it could be about video games, whatever. We don't, by the way, I don't have an office though. Uh, tweet, you have five minutes or so, good luck.
take one more minute to wrap up, and um, we'll have a couple of words from Dion from GRP and one final performance from North Coast Performers. So just a couple more uh, seconds to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you so much, and um, I am not going to try and improvise uh, at this stage, um, but I do want to thank you all for hanging out with GRP. I think that was a cool strap line. I think we're going to use that a lot more. This is uh, very, very nice of you all to be, be with us. Um, I have just a, a quick few remarks just to thank you all for your time with us and to just sketch out a little bit of the way forward that you have a sense that we're going to take this work forward. So just... Uh, uh, we have been capturing everything that you have given us today. There's been rapporteurs that have been pu uh, putting everything together. There will be a document, an outcome document, that's going to come out of this process almost immediately uh, that will describe some of the essence of what we did here today. And they'll be working on a more uh, inclusive outcome document that you all can be part of that will feed into various processes. We're hoping that this group can convene at a regular basis uh, to uh, revisit what we did here today together and to be able to uh, track and support each other in implementing the things that we spoke about and that we committed to uh, today. So definitely want to leave you with a sense of, of action and um, decentralized action. When I was thinking of, of uh, creating a movement, and as a South African, it was uh, very touching to Pablo hear uh, the words you were saying about Nelson Mandela. And when I think of those those leaders, yes, they were iconic leaders, but they were humble leaders who stood back and let others lead. And I think that's sort of, uh, you know, something that we've experienced here today is this uh, leadership through uh, many uh, organizations stepping to the fore. So not a centralized leadership, but a, a decentralized collective leadership that we've experienced here. So I want to start off uh, where, I, uh, where I started this morning and start off by thanking everybody, the 50 organizations that contributed to this day. It's been an amazing team effort. So thank you, everybody, for, for your amazing effort. Uh, give yourselves a good round of applause. And let's keep this team together. Let's keep this collaboration together. There are many opportunities coming up that we can... Uh, reconvene and, and uh, continue this amazing spirit that we have uh, built up in these uh, couple of days. But any uh, event like this requires some people to carry a little bit more of that weight and to be waking up, breathing, uh, sleeping, eating these, uh, what is happening and putting together a day like today, holding a million strings together at any one time. And so I want to pay tribute to two people from my team, uh, David Howlett and Anastasia Brani. Uh, who have done an amazing job. <laughs> David, you have done an incredible job, but we've almost come to expect it from you. You're a central figure in the team, and you are so good at this. So we really want you to, although we come to expect it from you, we uh, do want you to know that we really appreciate everything you do. So thank you, David. And um, let's give David a <laughs> round of applause. But I especially wanted to thank uh, Anastasia, who has uh, really been superhuman in what she's done. She has uh, been the central to this effort. Uh, she has uh, been calm under pressure. She has been wise in, in making decisions. And, uh, and, and she's also just actually put in a huge amount of work. So that combination of wisdom and hard work is really something which has been absolutely amazing in pulling this day off. So Anastasia, I want to give you a big round of applause. Thank you. Good, so that's it. Uh, we've had a long day together. Uh, thank you for hanging with GRP and back to the performers to uh, see us out for the day. Thank you. All right, okay, we're just gonna do a little bit of wrap up here and we want you all to get in involved, all right? <laughs>
<laughs> okay. No tweets. That's okay. all right. That's right. <laughs> okay. All right. So one thing from today that did resonate, you've got to change the way we communicate. It is not about our introspection. It's about making the good connection. Yeah, if we want to concentrate on improvement, we got to concentrate, communicate with our movement. Yes. We gotta change. We gotta be happy, not be really deranged. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we know what this is worth. This is all about saving our mother yes. Earth. Come over here. If you can just sing with me, I want you to go like this, all right? Everybody over here, we're gonna go resilience. Everyone, resilience. Let me hear you up there. Resilience. Cool, keep it going. Resilience. All right. Let me get this section right here to go.